Well, welcome to another session in our Women Lead webinar series brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas and I'm your host today and we are delighted to bring yet another informative webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Our Women Lead webinars are designed for you, the professional leader in business, whether you're an aspiring leader or you're leading people or projects, teams or a company or a business, we select topics and themes that will support your goal to lead, achieve and succeed more effectively in business. Now our webinar is just shy of an hour and we will be answering any questions that you've submitted online during the presentation portion of our webinar. So if you have questions you'd like to present, just put them into the chat box and I will be sharing those with our presenter um, as we go through today. Now the focus of our webinar today is one that is really, really important, especially as more and more of us find ourselves you know, members of that sandwich generation where we're caring for people younger than us and we're caring for our parents. And so the title of our webinar today is The Moment, The Money, The Move, Elder Care Conversations. And I'm really excited to introduce our thought leader today, Jatana Williams of Beyond the Sky Solutions, LLC. And Beyond the Sky is a, a multifaceted organization, or organization that provides so much in the way of services and information, not only to people who are looking for input for what to do for their, their loved ones, but also doing caregiver training, assisted living consulting, and helping you with placement. And their mission is to support the partnership between quality care providers, families, and residents to assist in quality care delivery throughout their educational and solution-based programs. Personally, I am super excited to be listening to this webinar, having had uh, parents on both sides, you know, my husband's side and my side, needing to find out what are some of our options, what are some of the solutions. Um, it was just really difficult and scary and, and fraught with lots and lots and lots of questions. So I am very excited to introduce Jatana. So without any further ado, it is all yours, J Jatana. Let's, let's go. Anxious to hear what you've got to all share. All right. Oh, thank you so much, Patty. I'm so um, humbled and honored to be able to bring this information to uh, working caregivers. Um, a lot of people don't think to put themselves in that category. However, you know, every day, as you expressed with your situation, we get thrown into being a family caregiver. Um, according to the National Alliance for Caregiving, there was approximately 65.7 million Americans who served as family caregivers in the past year. Wow. So I, I just... Yeah, it's, it's staggering the amount of people who are dealing with this. So I'm honored to bring this information to you today. Um, let me get my, my little wonderful technology here to move. Um, you know, Patty, one of the things that really um, thrust me into making sure that people get as much information as they possibly can is my own situation with my parents. My mom has vascular dementia, and then my father just last year was diagnosed with having Parkinson's, which is also a form of dementia. And um, if I did not work in this field, I would be completely overwhelmed. Yes. So I always wanna make sure that people have as much resources as they possibly can. Um, because I know that it can be tough. So hang on one second and I will get this to go off right now. Do you see my, um, there, we there go. you Let's go. Try yeah. that. There we go. Let's try that. <laughs> All right. So why do I call it the moment? Uh, the moment is that diagnosis from a loved one's physician when you hear that word of your loved one has, 
And it doesn't have to be a memory impairment such as Alzheimer's or a vascular dementia. It can be any chronic illness that takes away the person's ability to live at home safely by themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is the moment that people are thrust into what's the next step. So we want to talk about, uh, first of all, some of those, those moments that people face. Um, I want everyone who is listening if you are not a family caregiver, I want you to imagine uh, an 85 year old lady who her husband has passed away over the past year, living in a 3000 square foot home with all of her children living in another state. Now she has been given the moment of getting a diagnosis that she cannot stay in her home alone anymore safely. Now imagine the anxiety and the fear that this woman has being that her children is not here. Mm -hmm. So now I want you to imagine the children getting the phone call that their mother has Alzheimer's. Let's just say Alzheimer's for uh, this situation. Now, You've got three different siblings that live in three different cities and, and everyone has three different personalities and everyone has independent thinking and their way of doing things. Now they've got to try to maneuver what's going on with their loved one, which can be very frightening uh, for any family member to deal with. So say you have one of the daughters and she comes home and she tries to make sense of what's going on with mom. And she finds out, all right, mom has been forgetting to turn off the oven. There's been several situations where the neighbor next door has come by because she's heard her mother's fire alarm go off mm. or she's left the stove top on. Right. You know, there's been situations where she's paying bills or overpaying the same bill. For example, the electricity or the phone bill. Situations where she's forgetting that she's forgotten what she had for breakfast. She's looking at her food and saying, did I eat already? I think I did. There's moments of subscriptions to magazines and different mail order things piling up because she does not recall what to do with these things. She's unable to do the steps that are necessary to writing a letter from addressing it to stamping it to putting it in the mail. So these are moments that she's experiencing. Or imagine that she's spilled milk, juice, coffee on the countertops and left it there, not because she's a messy person, but because she does not remember that that step right there of wiping the counter is the appropriate step. So what a lot of people have to realize in the moment is people's short-term memory goes before their long-term memory. Right. So right. when I say that, it's, it's that moment that, that's happening right then and there that people are forgetful, that people can't remember what's the next steps. So they might go from one room to the other being confused that, oh, I was just in the bathroom. Now I'm in my bedroom and I'm not too sure why I'm in here. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know about you, Patty, but sometimes I've done that. I've walked in the kitchen <laughs> and I said to myself, what am I doing in the kitchen? <laughs> what, did I come in here? I forgot what I came in here for. Yes, exactly. But there is a difference. Yeah, but, but there's a difference when you go into the other room and you stand there for a long period of time and you really can't recollect your thinking processes. Right. That's where it gets to be scary for people. Yes. Confusing the, the, the daytime, the nighttime, that's a huge concern. Leaving things uh, spoiled in the refrigerator. Or one of the biggest things we notice with our loved one is that they might have dirty clothes on or a body order or 
we could smell urine simply because they're having accidents and they're unable to care for themselves and stay clean and stay on top of their hygiene. And then sometimes they might have several different types of the same products, such as ketchup or mustard or things like that. So all of these things are the moments that we know something is not right with our loved ones. Something must be done because it is just not safe for them to be home alone. And all of these things add up to someone not being able to have good short-term memory. Now, I know a lot of people think, well, wait, Jatana, but my mom can tell me all about her growing up. She can tell me about her career. She brings up things from when we grew up. Well, you know what? That's only because she's living in her long-term memory. And that always goes last, but the, the short-term memory is what leaves people immediately. So you know, those every, are the moments. Everything mm -hmm. that you've had on these last two slides were things that we, that we experienced. And it's so easy to excuse a few of them until, like you said, mm -hmm. they all pile up together and suddenly you realize there's something really, really big going on here, you know, mm -hmm. something that's just way out of the norm. Yes. And, and you know what, Patty, the thing is, on this slide here, these are the different bullet points where we know we have to act, because not only is it just a forgetful uh, situation, now we're getting into the dangerous zone here. Yes. Um, when a person becomes isolated, and that's because they're noticing that something's wrong with them. So the thing that people uh, don't realize is, you know, just because a person gets such a memory impairment, such as Alzheimer's, doesn't mean the person goes away. Mm -hmm. That person's still in there. And so who they are, they, they don't want their friends and, and their acquaintances to know they're having this problem. So they might isolate themselves, which puts them at danger for having depression and yes. depression could be you know a whole other fearful thing for our elderly so we don't want them to isolate themselves and then when they get into this point of you know weight loss or you know weight gain um those both are very dangerous areas if it's not a healthy weight gain mm -hmm. or healthy weight loss right um hiding food you know inappropriate dress their conversations is here is, you know, taking medication uh, incorrectly or mm -hmm. not taking medications at all. I know for me with my mother, uh, before I truly wanted to not be in denial anymore about what was going on with her, she was taking about 13 different medications and half of them she was forgetting to take. So, you know, as family caregivers, we have to step in on making sure that they are taking their medications or that they're taking the right medication. Because once I took her medication list to the doctor and we went over all of the medications, we were able to cut that down. So now she's only on a few prescription meds and some vitamins and mm -hmm. it's improved her quality of life majorly. So yeah. I remember yeah, when my father-in-law was uh, had just entered hospice care, and he was still in his his mobile home. Um, but we got a call. Uh, it was the day before Thanksgiving. I'll never forget it. Day before Thanksgiving, we get a call from one of the hospice workers, and they said, "This weekend, you've got to move your dad into some sort of a care facility, either assisted living or board and care something, because he had taken, uh, on one of his medications, he had taken like three or four days worth of it. And, you know, so where you're, you're thinking you've put all these safeguards in place, you know, including having a hospice person come, but in the, you know, just the five or six hours between one hospice worker and another, he had done that. And so mm -hmm. we, you know, we had to, over Thanksgiving weekend, we had to find support for him. And it, it is, it's frightening when you realize what, 
could happen if you if you don't take some steps. And you know, Patty, that you know, I, I, for me, in, in being in this industry, one of the things that I advocate for is people not to wait until they get into those situations with their loved ones. I, I really would like for people to look at mom and dad while they're healthy, mm-hmm. <laughs> while they're doing well, and start having conversations with their loved one while they're healthy and doing well about, yeah. hey, mom, if, if, if you were to fall, and I'm not saying you'd fall, mom, I'm not saying, I'm not wishing that on you, but if you were to fall, mom, and you could no longer be able to be at home and take care of yourself, you know, have you ever thought about how you want to be cared for? So you can have the conversation in advance of mom falling and hurting her head, breaking her hip, and not being able to think correctly. Mm -hmm. Because then it's not all put on the children as to what decisions are made. There's been some kind of discussion about what mom wants and and that's so important yeah because I'm sure when you were dealing with that you were trying to figure out well what would dad want right Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) yeah Mm -hmm. and he surprised us because what we thought he would want was not what he wanted you know it after uh, all so uh, that was interesting mm mm-hmm 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 And one of the things that you brought up with uh, what happened with your situation is, uh, you know, trying to make the decisions. There's boarding care. And Mm -hmm. a lot of people don't even know what a boarding care is. Um, So we'll talk about that in this presentation. But, you know, one of the things that I want to clarify for people is the cost. Mm -hmm. Um, Because it's quite the uh, shock to people. Um, They assume, oh, well, we've got Medicare. You know, um, you've got a little bit of savings. Okay, well, let's talk about what the costs are because there are different types of costs associated. So I'm going to base this basically off of San Diego County numbers. And there could be people who um, are on this listening that are in other states or uh or whatever. So I want you to look at the Gen Worth Cost of Care survey. If anybody wants to Google that information, you can actually click on this survey um, for the different states where you may live and look up information as to what the average cost is for these different levels of care. So my information is based off of San Diego, and the first one is The home caregiver. So a home caregiver, that's the person coming into the house. We'll talk about that. And the average cost is about $5,335 per month. And it could add up to about $13,000 per month. Um, $13,000 per month is basically around-the-clock care. um, And that is the average. And it can go up from that number based off of what are all the services included in that care. And then we're looking at adult daycare, which is if you are a working caregiver, which most of you are, and you take your loved one to, it's like a child care center, except it's for adults. Mm-hmm. And you take them for the day while you're working, we're looking at about six, oh, a little over 1600 a month. Mm-hmm. Assisted living, we're looking at almost 5000 which is completely different from memory care. Then we have nursing home, which involves nursing, nurses, physicians, physical therapists, occupational therapists. We're looking at for a shared room, basically, almost 10000 a month. So these are our costs here that's up on the screen that unless you're in the nursing home, is an out-of-pocket cost unless a person has long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of people say, yes, my my loved one has long-term care insurance. Well, please dig that policy out (laughs) 
go to an insurance professional and make sure you review it because I've had a client that have, was paying into a policy for many, many years thinking I'm good, no problem. But when the occasion arrived, it, it happened that um, the wording in that policy stated that that person actually had to be in a nursing home for them to use the policy to pay for the care. Oh, wow. So, so that person was very upset because he did not want his wife to be in a nursing home because mm-hmm. they're all, there's different types. He wanted her to be in an assisted living. And so he was very upset that he had to uh, come out of pocket for her to get the type of care that he wanted her to have versus being in a, in a nursing home. So I advise everybody, if you do have a long-term care policy, to dig that out and have it reviewed by an insurance professional to make sure it's exactly what you want. Yeah. Um, so I advise that. That's good. Now, good advice. There, yeah. Yeah. Now there are some, uh, there are some different insurances, uh, different riders, different add on policies, uh, for Medicare that actually will help with paying for, uh, assisted living. Now they don't advertise it. <laughs> They're not shouting it from the rooftop. So look at your policy to see exactly, you know, what all is included and what you're paying for, if, especially if you're doing a supplemental to your uh, regular health care insurance. Mm-hmm. So I advise everybody to really dig into all of the coverage they have to see what benefits, because there's also life insurance that has uh, different riders as well to help pay with the cost of care. So talk with your insurance professional and get that help. So who's paying cash? You see, I put cash in big caps there Mm -hmm. because that is the number one uh, use for paying for care. The long-term care, of course, life insurance policies, health insurance plans, There is a a program here in California called the Assisted Living Waiver Program. Now, this is something that is paid for through Medi-Cal, but there there is a long waiting list for an elderly person to use this service. And also, there are a lot of stipulations to someone being able to use the program. So a person will actually have to be coming out of a hospital setting uh, into an assisted living setting to have priority to use this waiver. So there's a lot of moving pieces with that. Mm -hmm. Um, Then there's the selling of the home, of course. You can sell the home, use that cash, or there's reverse mortgage. Again, please make sure that you work with your financial planner, advisor, uh, or an insurance agent to make sure that any of these things that you set up is going to be the right thing for the long-term care of your loved one. So what are the options of care? Um, Like you said, Patty, you were dealing with your father and you all had to look at that. How long did it take you to come up with uh, what you were going to do next? Well, we had been, uh, this was my father-in-law, and before this, we'd been investigating assisted living options. Um, His mother was still alive, and she wanted to go into assisted living uh, because she was afraid that he was going to die and she would be left alone. So all of our research had been done in assisted living places. Well, as, you know, life you know, laughs when we make plans, she passed away first. And he was, Mm. he was pretty ill. And so he was trying to stay in his trailer. We had hospice, you know, caring for him. But when they said, you need to do something right now, well, we had this short list of assisted living that we had already been to look at vetted, you know, and, and had this short list. And he said, no, I don't want to do that. I, I don't want to go into that place. I want to go, I want to be in somebody's home. We hadn't even 
considered that. We never, it never dreamed on us that he would want something like that because he was kind of a mm -hmm. antisocial little guy, you know? And so we're suddenly <laughs> like, what? You want to do what? And the hospice people were just a godsend. You know, they, they gave us a mm. name of three places and literally over Thanksgiving weekend, we're driving to these places with him and letting him look at them. And we had him settled before the weekend was out, but that was only because we had hospice helping him, helping us. If he had said that and we didn't have them, I don't, I don't think I would have even known where to start. I didn't even know there was such a thing as board and care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's the thing. There's so many different options. And what's really crazy about it, Patty, is within those options of boarding cares, there's options. Yes. So not all of them are the same. They offer different levels. Um, not all of them take the same types of conditions of your loved one. Mm -hmm. So like you said, the hospice was a godsend to you because they already had some options for your family. But so many people are out there doing this research and not sure on their own because they just don't know right. and like you said they wouldn't even have known that there was such a thing called boarding cares which a lot of people don't mm -hmm. um so we're going to talk about some of those options a home care home health uh comfort care which is the hospice assisted living boarding cares home memory cares and there's skilled nursing um so oops let me go back so sorry so let me let me tell you first of all, um, home care is when you have someone that wants to stay at home. So say if your father was like, you know what, I just want to stay home. Now the thing about the home care is um, it can be quite costly if a person needs 24 seven around the clock care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is when a team of people will come into the home. Home health is what's covered by your health insurance. And that has to be ordered by a physician. Okay. And that is a team of clinical people, such as a nurse, um, occupational therapist, and so forth. Then we're dealing with comfort care, which is hospice. And, you know, the thing about hospice is people need to talk about hospice care services before they actually need it. So they know what hospice they want to work with and understand that hospice can be something utilized sooner than later. Mm -hmm. um, we want people to have the service for as long as possible. Uh, then there's assisted living, which is basically the custodial care. Then there's the boarding care homes. I put their homes because that's when someone actually, uh, goes into a six bed place and live there. And then the memory care is when someone has memory impairment. And of course the skilled nursing is when they need to be um, in more of a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. And according to uh, AARP, 92% of the people over the age of 65, they really want to stay in their home because they're comfortable that they're comfortable there. They really feel like this is what I need to do. Um, to be comfortable. So we think, okay, caring conversations, how do we have those caring conversations? Well, the first thing is if we're not, if we're not feeling like we're in the place where we can truly um, bring it up to our loved one or truly say, uh, mom and dad, what are your wishes? What if you became ill or you were no longer able to make decisions for yourself because of mental capacity, you know, what would you like to see? So in your case, Patty, you were shocked that your dad was, no, I want to be in a house. I want to mm -hmm. be in a boarding care. Yeah. You know, so somebody somewhere at some point had a conversation with your dad mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> for him to be aware of that. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so I think that's the key is to just, if, you, if, if we are not comfortable with the conversation, to bring in professionals to have the conversation uh, with them. 
so that they can document. And some of some of the most helpful people I have found in this industry is, you know, there's placement organizations, but then there's also elder law attorneys, which are so key to having the conversation because they're able to help with documenting what a person needs or wants mm -hmm. um, and making it legal, you know. Right. right. Oh, that's a really good point. And we, you know, with my parents, um, we had conversations with them before they needed to make the decision, but uh, around what we were moving them from another state, we were moving them to California to be closer to my brother and my sister and I, and um, they were, my mother didn't want to go anywhere, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way she mm -hmm. was. But my dad was like, yeah, I would like to be in a assisted living where there's graduated care, you know, so that you, up until the point of needing memory care, you know, they could stay right there. And it was a nice little apartment and, um, and so forth. But we, we were able to have that conversation with them where we weren't, you know, really with my father-in-law ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and let me let me go back to the slide really quick, just to so that people can write down or think about when you're looking at assisted living um, versus boarding care um, and memory care. So let, let's 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 look at these differences here. So with assisted living, many times with assisted living, we're just looking at a person needing a little med management, a little medication management. Um, they might need help with incontinence care. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a robust program of activities and things for them to do so that they can have a good quality of life. Right. And that is the same thing with a boarding care, except we're looking at them being in a house, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a setting with five other individuals usually because most of these places are six beds. Um, when we start talking about memory care, we're talking about when a person has memory impairment, um, some diagnosis of dementia, whether that's Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, Lewy body, you know, there's so many different types of dementias. That's because the commonality is they have had memory loss. Right. So when we look at these three here, um, you know, you'll see that in some settings, uh, there is what you say, the continuous care, you know, continuing community. So a person can move in as an independent, which I don't have listed here, independent, that's someone who does not need care, and they just want to socialize with other people, their peers. Mm -hmm. And if they start needing care, they can go into an assisted living. And then when assisted living is uh, no longer appropriate, they can go to a memory care and then from the memory care if necessary to the skilled. So that there's a lot of buildings or properties that have all three levels or, or four on the same lot, on the right. same community. So people don't have to move anywhere when their level of care changes. Right. So yeah, that's a great option for people as well. So, I mean, there's just so many different moving pieces, as you learned, to this, that um, if people don't do research in, ahead, in advance, ahead of the issue, ahead of the emergency, then it can be a problem. Yes. Um, so one of the things I wanted to bring up is, you know, just people being prepared. So making sure that individuals, you know, uh, gather all the information they possibly can. You know, that, that's key, that's key is, you know, if you're able to lay your eyes on the various places, um, please do. I advise people to go by at uh, different hours. Yes. You know, if they won't allow you to um, visit at different hours, then do a drive-by, you know, mm -hmm. get in the car, drive by, see what, what are things looking like. You have to kind of think like you're buying a house. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. where would you want your loved ones to live, right? Um, you know, uh, look at your options, look at what you can put in place, uh, talk to professionals to help uh, put everything in place, uh, make sure you're communicating with your loved one's physician, their nurses, everybody who cares for them, 
um, like in your case, it was the hospice folks, and they were able to give you great recommendations. And, you know, taking charge. Now, I want to emphasize here, because I talk with and I do a lot of training for the actual care providers, and one of the things that happens is, there is a breakdown between care providers and the families having good conversations in a lot of cases. Yes. So when I say you're taking charge, I don't mean bullying the people that care for your loved one. I don't mean, you know, stepping all over them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I say take charge, I mean just being informed and having the information and having conversations with the people that take care of your loved one to get their needs met not to cause more problem. And there's, you know, there's ways to do it without, uh, you know, making the situation worse or belittling the people who, who care for your loved one. So, yes. so when I say take charge, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's not guns blazing, you right. know? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, we were, my parents were in a, an assisted living facility for uh, probably about four years or so, my mom passed away there and my dad stayed for another year before um, his Alzheimer's advanced to the place where they couldn't care for him. But they were incredibly receptive to all of our questions and they were also really good about the fact that um, I was uh, out of state for part of that time and my brother was in state. So it might be that I called and asked questions without knowing that my brother had also called and asked similar questions. And they never made us feel like we were bugging or just give us one point of contact or they, they were just really, really great, you know, about um, being very patient with us because they know, they know the terms, they know what, you know, how to do certain things, but we don't, we're not experts in this. So I, mm -hmm. I was very grateful to them that we had found the place that we did. That's wonderful. And, you know, I, I'm glad that you had a good, a good uh, experience because unfortunately a lot of people don't get a great experience in finding something for their loved one. They might, you know, go online and do some research mm -hmm. and put their name into a system. And the next thing you know, they're bombarded with hundreds of calls Yeah, that's so and funny. it's overwhelming to make decisions, you know, so mm -hmm. it's really good to work with different professionals or people, you know, and trust to help you to, you know, come with a really good care plan for your loved one. And I, you know, even though I'm far from the age of needing <laughs> to have any kind of care, I have four sons, so and they're all very different in their personalities. So I have it written down as to what I want specifically, uh, because I can just imagine the four of them sitting around the table trying to make decisions for me. I, it would just be, it would be awful. <laughs> Not that they don't love me. It's just that, oh my gosh, they're all so different in personality. And I, I think one of my sons would probably have me living in a place that's way too expensive. And my other son would say, you know, put her in the room and give her some food, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it is funny, the differences in that, um, exactly as you said, because my, uh, my brother was of the mind, I'm going to build an addition on my house and my parents will live here. And I was like, mm. that is really not a good idea because, you know, mom would not like that. Remember, she's always said she doesn't want to live with her kid. And, you know, and so uh -huh. we, when it came down to where it was just my, my father was the only one left, um, you know, he and I had to have some really straight, um, to the heart conversations. I said, this would be really bad for your family to have dad living here in the condition he's in now because your lifestyle is very busy. You know, you've got kids running in and out, you know, grandkids running in and out all the time. It would be disruptive to him as well as disruptive to the way that you live. And, you know, yes. we, it, it was a great conversation for us to have together, but it was, here's my perspective. Well, here's my perspective. And it, it's exactly what you said, what he thought would be right. What I thought would be right. were vastly, 
far apart. Yes. Yes. And that's why it's so important that people look at all three of these areas in making the plans because it's all inclusive in making good decisions. This is looking at the medical side for your loved one, the legal side, and the insurance side. Mm -hmm. So all three areas need to be considered. Um, and, and in your case, you know, the personality, your brother thought this is a great idea, but hello, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. So making sure that there is, you know, things written down legally from your loved one as to what they want so that the kids can honor exactly what is needed. Yes. Um, so you mentioned earlier that, you know, it is our, it is our goal to work well with senior care providers and families. So, you know, we're all about educating family caregivers on what their options are, you know, and I always tell individuals, sit down with one of our consultants, you know, it's free. It's free for you to give us a call, uh, make an appointment talk with one of our uh, consultants via phone um, or in person and talk about what it is that your loved one needs or what you're looking for your loved one and see if we can't be of help. We do utilize a, a system that's called the best fit. And basically it is asking a lot of questions so we can learn about who your loved one is because, you know, we talk about it's assisted living, it's boarding care, it's this, it's that. But who is your loved one? Who is your mom? Who is your dad? And what would bring them the best quality of life and quality of care possible is the focus, mm -hmm. is the focus. You know, because as you stated, Patty, you know, your, your dad with the hospice, we want the person to get the best care possible and to get that end of life care that they deserve, you know, and not all places are equal in that and not all services are. So we just want to help people to narrow down what, what they're looking for and, you know, get the best care possible. Yes. So, yes. So if people have any questions or concerns or, I mean, I didn't go in too much detail because of time, but you know, basically, as we talk about the moment of realizing your loved one is having a problem, that's the time when you need to start talking about what are we going to do. Um, you know, me and my siblings, we were, we were texting each other yesterday about my mom. And we were saying, did you notice this? Did you notice that? You know, she has caregivers that come to the house. And we're like, okay, now we're getting to the point where we've got to think about moving her because being in the house is no longer going to be safe for her. And this is why. Mm -hmm. So the moment people realize that, um, you know, something needs to be done is when the conversation needs to start. We can't be in denial because what denial does is it, it, it sets things to the side until someone falls. Yes. or until there's an emergency. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, so they can always call us if they have questions or, or any concerns or they're not sure what steps to take. We're, he'll, we're here to be of assistance in all cases, for That's sure. Great. This is, um, has been so informative and, and really so incredibly helpful. Um, you know, I, I shared about our experience and we were fortunate to be, uh, at that time I was still local to my parents as was my brother and my sister, but um, I have friends who have, you know, their loved ones are in, in facilities out, out of state and what in the world would we have done out of state? So it's just wonderful to know that there's a service like yours. Um, we drove by, you know, lots of them. We made un, un, uh, scheduled visits to drop in and, and just kind of walk around. And for the most part, they were gracious about that and understood that, look, we're trying to see what really goes on, not what you want us to see that goes on and and we made some decisions you know because of that like well, I don't know we're not putting them in here you know but um if right. we weren't you know what do you do if you're if you're not close and so forth so to know that 
that there's an organization like yours, I think is, is fabulous. And I think just such a service, you know, to, to people and, um, thank you. You don't know what you don't know, you know, basically, um, Exactly. There's, there's a, um, an organization that we used um, to benefit my mom and dad. My father was a veteran, and it's not a very well-known program because they, I think, you know, like with most government assistants, they don't want you to know it's really there. And we found out about yeah. <laughs> it by going to a, you know, an open forum, you know, where they talked about it, but it was called Veterans Assistance. And um, once they moved mm -hmm. into a facility, then they had some funds that were available to them, which really, really helped because it it does get, you know, in, incredibly expensive and and people are living longer than they used to as well. And yes, you, you know, and what, people need to be. Yeah. And they need to be mindful with the veterans aid and attendance, because there are a lot of people out there that. Um, they're, they're charging a lot of money to help people with filling out that paperwork mm -hmm. and, or they're telling people they need to move money around in order to get approved for the veterans aid and attendance. So truly people need to go through the VA to get assistance. There are different libraries here in San Diego County that offer a service for you to come in and sit with someone who is a professional at uh, the veterans aid and attendance program so that they can be of assistance in helping people with the paperwork and not pay hundreds of dollars, which they shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. The only time a person should be charging for that is if you're getting some other service from them. Right. But um, that is one of the reasons why working with an elder uh, care attorney, um, a professional that you know is reputable is the best thing because there are, there's a lot of fraud, unfortunately, uh, with that, mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. you know, with all things, but yes, I'm so glad you, you brought that up. Yes. Yes. Um, Jatana, what, do you have any advice for folks if they do have a loved one in a facility and maybe they're not, uh, really pleased with the care or the, um, the service that they're being provided, what would you advise that they do? Well, if they're, if they're in a small boarding care, then they would want to go directly to the administrator of that home and make it known that they're not happy. Um, if they don't get satisfaction there, they can always call the ombudsman program uh, if they're, they don't get the satisfaction from there, then they can always call um, community care licensing. Mm, so okay. all of these, uh, so all of these options to complain or uh, bring up their dissatisfaction, there should be postings in every building, if it's a boarding care or large assisted living or memory care, with phone numbers and contacts on who family can contact to um, complain, basically. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you don't have to sit in silence. There are options to have your voice heard. Okay, that's great. That's good to know. And then um, another question that came in is, what about places that, um, that you basically buy into? So you, like you turn over your social security or, or your retirement or what have you, and you have basically bought into this, um, into this retirement or this um, assisted living program. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some beautiful uh, properties in San Diego County, Orange County, all over where you actually buy in. And usually people go into those places because of uh, tax tax issues, um, financial uh, benefits to doing oh, that. Oh. Um, yeah, so wealth management. Mm -hmm. So I suggest that anybody who's looking at that, that you sit down and talk with a financial advisor um, before doing that and look at all the different options that are available to that. Um, because usually that's all about people um, wanting to have, say, like a property, 
<laughs> it's like yeah. having a property. Yes. And so, yeah, so there's some, they, they really need to sit with their financial advisor and discuss those options and how they're going to go about it and what community they're going to go into. Cause there are some really great options in San Diego County to do that. Yeah, that's great. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So I, again, Jatana, I just, I thank you for this information. This has been fabulous. And I wanted again to show the slide with all of your contact information on there. And, you know, I, I love how you stressed, start thinking about this before you need to think about it, have the conversations before it becomes, you know, mandatory and, and pressured to do that. And, you know, mm -hmm. eventually everybody's going to be here. So it's a, <laughs> it's a good, good thing to know and, and good to have resources to call on. So thank you again so much. I really appreciate Thank you, Patty. Your thank you for here. sharing your story. I appreciate it. And, and thanks to everybody that has joined us today. Um, this is, like I said, been just one of, uh, one of our, our most informative and so forth. And um, we're so grateful that you joined us. And be sure to be watching our Facebook page, the Connected Women of Influence Facebook page, our website. There are webinars every month on topics that are going to help you be the best you that you can be. So thank you again so much for sharing. Thank you again, Jatana, for your time. We so much appreciate it. And I look forward thank to seeing you. all of you on another webinar soon. All right. Have a blessed one. Thank you, Betty.